It's the first Thursday in October. Time for Cinema Hits and Misses. I'm Dawn. And I'm John. You tuned in to WMPG 90.9 and WMPG.org. What have we got for movies tonight, John? Uh, so we have Deepwater Horizon, Miss Peregrine's School for Peculiar Children, and Queen of Catway. It's October. We don't have a horror one, which, well, yeah. like, we might mention something at the end, but nice to have a switch here. Yeah. A- what do you want to start off with? Uh, let's start off with Deepwater Horizon. Okay. Now, this film is based on the events involving the explosion of the oil rig, known as the Deepwater Horizon, off the coast of Louisiana on April 10th or 20th, 2010. We open up with Mike Williams, the chief electrical, electrical engineer of the rig, and his family. After listening to his daughter give her presentation about his job, she then asked Mike's, Mike if he could bring back a fossil so that she could show to her classmates that her father tames the dinosaurs. We then follow Mike to the helipad where he meets up with sev- several other BP workers. When they arrive, they hear that a cement test wasn't ever done, which raises concern. When confronting the BP executives, they're told that the rig is perfectly fine and that they must get back to getting oil. After some pressure tests, one negative followed by one positive, the crew gets to work. But something goes wrong. This leads to the blowout and explosion on the rig. Dealing with the chaos around him, Mike and the other survivors must escape the rig before they are engulfed by the flames. Now, this is a film directed by Peter Berg and stars Mark Wahlberg, Kurt Russell, Gina Rodriguez, John Malkovich, and Kate Hudson. The movie currently has an 83% on Rotten Tomatoes certified fresh, and 88% of audiences liked it. And I'd probably agree with both of that. Yeah. You know, it's... This is... Yeah. For as much as you think you know the story, I mean, obviously it dominated the news, and of course, the spilling of the oil dominated the news. Oh yes. The human story behind it is something that was fresh to me. That, you know, getting to know these characters and um, you know, opening up, I think, was clever with the Mike Williams testimony, because it you open up to the audio, so it's the dark screen and the audio of his testimony. You get a sense of what happened there, and then you're introduced to the characters. Yeah, I think it's also just used as a reminder that this is this is true. This actually happened, um, but then you're brought right in from the beginning. Uh, like even like right after that testimony, there's like a shot underwater. You see an air bubble just pop up underneath from the cement. Yeah, and in, for me, it was a reminder. I mean, obviously, you see these big oil rigs mostly in down in, in the south. Kind of think that they are cemented down, but really they're they're floating their ships. Yeah. And, you know, what they've got connecting them is this plug into the earth that's drilling for oil. And how much that tenuous attachment um, really relies on both the art of drilling and the science behind it. Yeah. And it was good also that there was that presentation at the beginning as just a way to show, like, this is how it's done. Because otherwise, you know, some people may not understand exactly how it works, myself included. I wasn't <laughs> exactly sure. It's like, oh, they just bring oil up, right? That's it. But no, there's definitely a lot more to it, and I'm glad they showed me that so I could have a better understanding of what was happening as things unfolded in the film. Yeah, and I, I clipped this line from one of the – something I was reading that, um, of course, the screenwriters, Matthew Michael Carnahan and Matthew Sand, have designed the dialogue both to instruct and to overwhelm. And I think it's true on both parts, but I don't know about o- overwhelming in the sense that you get a sense of the grandeur of this, I think. Um, not that it's going to trounce you over the head, because I think they brought it to a language that audiences would understand. Yeah, for for sure. I definitely agree on that. You know, and what we think of mud isn't what oil dr- drillers think of mud. Yeah, it's a, it's a more horrifying thing. Yeah, and you know... Peter Berg does this kind of film well. I mean, he does, you know, attacks on Western compounds in Saudi Arabia, which was the kingdom, Lone Survivor, which was Afghanistan. And, you know, he does well putting together these moving parts. And I think it doesn't hurt that um, this is the second of three partnerships that he's had with Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, there's another one coming right around the corner, too. Yeah, Patriot's Day, which which the trailer showed in my theater. It wasn't in your theater. I, yeah, I did get to see the trailer eventually. Yeah. That's coming out in December, which is really soon. Yeah, so it's, you know, it was, it's a good, I thought it was a good marketing tie-in on our end. But 
Um, I saw this with a full audience, and I think both they and I appreciated it. I mean, it's again, you have a formula here. You have an arc. You're setting up the scene. You set up the characters enough that you see this, especially the camaraderie between these three players, um, the Mark Wahlberg character, Mike Williams, Kurt Russell as Jimmy Harrell, and Gina Rodriguez as Alicia Fletes. Mm -hmm. You see that triangle, and then you see the BP people. And if you weren't angry at BP before, you probably will be now. Oh, yes. I, one thing I really enjoyed about this film is that it, it's definitely a reminder that this could have been entirely prevented if they just hadn't done it. I think just like they did a good job establishing that. I'm like, oh, well, that it, it is really just like an old, old, like a tragic disaster movie. It just it works so well for me. I, I really like I said, I really enjoyed this overall. It definitely helps that the performances were, were good for the most part. I mean, I believe, like, I believe the camaraderie is like, you know, as they're all arriving on the rig and they're like brief interactions. I thought they like they played off each other well. I believe that they were real and they weren't just you know phoning it in. Especially, I thought Kurt, Kurt Russell was great. You know, as always, you can't go wrong with Kurt Russell. Yeah, Mark Wahlberg was good too. And depending on, I guess, depending on who's listening to this, um, Deepwater Horizon. Peter Berg kind of reminds me of an, a modern-day Irwin Allen. Irwin Allen in the 70s did a lot of disaster films, especially like The Towering Inferno. Mm -hmm. So of the time, I, I guess of the – Irwin Allen might have been the Peter Berg of his time in showing fire as a character or what have you because that was definitely a character in this film here, Deepwater Horizon. And if you're just tuning in, you've got Cinema Hits and Misses. John and I are talking about Deepwater Horizon. We're going to move on to Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children and Queen of Catway in a little bit. But, um, you know, for this one, I am so glad that I did see it in the theater. Oh, it yeah, just, me too. It just envelops you. Yeah, like once it gets going, once, you know, the blowout happens, I was in, I was in it. From start to end on that part, um, it's nonstop thrills. It's insanity. It, it's directed really well. Uh, yeah, I mean, there really isn't much that I didn't dislike about this movie. I think the only thing that bothered me was this one moment at the end. It's just this random interaction between Mark Wahlberg's character and another character. And it just, it seems out of place. It's a bit awkward. I didn't understand why it was in the film entirely i felt like we could have gotten rid of it and it just would it wouldn't have changed the impact of the movie like it doesn't it really doesn't change it too much but to me it just felt off yeah and i know it's seen you talking about john it was a it was a scene that shows the depth of the emotion but without the background of who that person belonged to what the tie-in was it just felt felt so out of place, and I think that's an editing error. That either they should have put in the little snippet of who that character was and why was he, he so upset, or like I said, take it out because it didn't add any value. Yeah. But, but otherwise, pretty solid movie. Yeah, I'd recommend this if you're looking for a good, you know, uh, dis like disaster movie, a good biopic. I think it, you know, works well. So. Yeah. So moving on from Deepwater Horizon, we have Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Jake is a pretty ordinary teenager growing up in a nondescript Florida town. He especially feels this way after hearing such wondrous tales from his grandfather, Abe, about a group of amazingly talented orphans that grew up with Abe in Wales during the pre-World War II years. As Jake grew older... He, like his parents, started thinking that the tales were his grandfather's flights of fancy and increased paranoia. One night, Jake receives a call to check on Grandpa Abe. A kind co-worker drives him out to Abe's, where a spooky mist is hovering over the retirement community. Abe's house is in tatters. Someone's broken in and tossed the place. Jake finds Abe, near death, with his eyes plucked out. Abe utters some nonsensical words right before he dies, something about finding the bird. This is when Jake sees something, something big and beyond his comprehension. Luckily, his co-worker is packing a pistol and her random shooting scares it away. With officials explaining this strange death away, 
Jake is left both mourning Abe and trying to survive therapy. A 16th birthday present from Abe sets him on a new course, visiting the Welsh Isle of Carnholm and seeing the orphanage himself. He convinces his parents and therapist that a trip would help him heal, and they reluctantly agree. On Carnholm, Carnholm, Jake and his dad find that the orphanage is a long gone, bombed out during an air raid in 1943. But Jake is still curious and seeks out the ruins of the once grand house. Once inside, it seems that he's not quite alone, and maybe these peculiar children that Abe grew up with might still be around. Miss Peregrine Home. Peregrine's Home for Ch- Peculiar Children is based on the best-selling novel by Ransom Riggs, brought to life on the screen by director Tim Burton and writer Jane Goldman, rated PG-13 with a two-hour running time. What do you think, John, of Miss Peregrine? Uh, I I liked it. I didn't love it. I think there's... I I love the mythology behind it. I thought that yeah. was really interesting. But then the problem is, is the film develops. It creates a lot more issues. Mm-hmm. So the thing is, is that um, where the children are, they're in a time loop. They live in the same day in 1943, the day where the, so the children or the orphanage was destroyed by a bomb. Well, it turns out the time loop is during the day that the bomb comes down. So there's you know there's a little scene where you know the the air raid's about to start. You see the bomb just about to hit the house, and then they the loop happens. It rewinds time back 24 hours. So I like that idea. It's like, oh, so they just they're they're kind of out of sight as long as you know you're not looking for them, I guess. So I and I you know each they're kind of like X the X Men in a sense. Or some people I remember people right. online are calling it like Tim Burton's X Men. Right. It's a it's a good laugh, but. I, I mean, it really is. They each have their own abilities, and they're some of them are pretty neat. Some of them are just there, I guess. You know. Yeah, I think I read probably the same thing you did about the X Men, or like Willy Wonka meets the X Men. <laughs> and there's, of course, tie. I guess the the book was also um, compared to the Harry Potter series or um, the Lemony Snicket series. So you have this fantastical kind of a dark gothic tin story. Uh, an ordinary seeming boy meeting up with these peculiar children. So like you, John, I think the mythology was what drew me in. The trailers look wonderful for this. Yeah. The execution, not quite what I had expected. And I, 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 I left wanting more, but not in a good way. Yeah. You know? I, I kind of agree with that. And that one of the things that involves with is with Ava Green. I loved her in this movie. Mm-hmm. I thought she was great. She takes like when she's on screen, she commands it and it's great but the problem is she's not in enough like i i want more instead we're hanging around with asa butterfield and he was okay like i didn't find him the most interesting character he was kind of almost just a little bit annoying at points too like yeah. I, I just wish we had i wish we could have just you know followed maybe even his grandfather back in the day that would have been i guess a little bit more interesting instead of well, and that's the thing, too. It's his grandfather, who's played by Terrence Stamp, who is a pretty captivating character, actor himself. Again, I wanted so much more from him. And hopefully this does well enough that we see more of the story, because I would be in for another movie to have expanded on this and hopefully give him a chance, because I want to know more, actually, about more about Abe and more about Abe's time. For the kids. True, but the the thing is that the, the film, where it goes, leaves a lot of like logic problems yeah. and and time travel and it's it it kind of hurt my head. Is I'm like now <laughs> everything's just kind of messed up. I don't really know what like how this could even work. How is this even possible? So it would I want to see another one? Maybe it have to. It would have to depend on the story that it wants to tell. I think. What saved it for me in wanting to see more is actually that last maybe 10 minutes of the film. And not so much, so much wanting to see Jake again, because, you know, he was Asa Butterfield as Jake was mediocre. I agree with you there. But what he does after the problem resolution mm-hmm. and his yep. travels, I wanted to know more about that, I think. And, you know, here in Cinema Hits, we don't want to give that away. So, Of course not. You know, in talking about Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, we want to leave enough mystery there in case you want to get caught in this time loop. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, if you're interested in this kind of thing, like the fantastical or a good, like a fantasy kind of film, you you'll probably get some enjoyment out of this. Like it's it's passable, but it's not great. I think that you know there's some things like there's some pacing issues, especially with the beginning or like more towards it. Kind of like it's whenever we're not at the orphanage is where it kind of loses steam. Yeah. And but the one thing I do like about that is the use of color grading. It's very like when they're when we're in real or we're in the you know we're in the present day, it's very it's very blue. It's, that was completely intentional. Mm-hmm. I could tell. And I really like that because then once we go to the orphanage in 1943, just the colors are so bright and vivid, and it's it's great. Like it, you know, has like almost a whimsical kind of value to it. Just really enhances that. I just wish we had. I guess we just wish we had more, uh, more of that. Yeah, and, you know, for me, Tim Burton as a director it can be a little bit hit or miss. I like the repairing with him and Eva Green. I think he. Did better by her in Dark Shadows. Not that I love Dark Shadows, because I grew up with a TV series, which I loved a whole lot more. But her character was so rich in that. And like you said, John, here, there's not enough of that character. It left me wanting, again, more in a good way. Yeah. And, you know, I'm coming off of the ending of Showtime's Penny Dreadful where she played such an important character. So to see her not as really the central character mm-hmm. left me a little bummed. But again, I agree. There, there are plot holes here that are kind of hard to ignore. Yeah, for sure. I Honestly, on my, or on my free press rating scale, I'd probably give this like a wait for a DVD, unless you're seriously interested in it, then go for it. But... I don't really think it's worth worth your money. I'd say go see Deep Water instead. Yeah. Or good transition. <laughs> <laughs> you tuned into Cinema Hits and Misses here. John and I have been talking about Deepwater Horizon, which we both highly recommend, and Miss Peregrine's Home for Pe- Peculiar Children, which we're probably gonna both say wait for. Our next movie is Queen of Catway. And John's gonna write up for that so, one. Yeah, so let's talk about this. So this film is like Deepwater Horizon, is also based on a true story. The film opens up with the main character, Fiona, entering a room. She approaches a table and gets ready to face off in a chess match against an opponent. Before the match begins, we are taken back several years earlier to the area of Katwe, a slum in Kampala, Uganda. Fiona lives in a small shack with her siblings and her mother. Every day, Fiona and her younger brother, Brian, go out into the streets and sell corn to drivers stuck in traffic. One day, Fiona sees Brian slip away, and so she follows him which leads her to a missionary building run by Robert Katende. Fiona looks inside and sees that the children that are gathering there are being fed, but they're also dumping wooden pieces onto a board. Katende sees Fiona standing outside and invites her in. The children mock and are in disgust of Fiona because of how she smells. Yet through this missionary, Fiona learns the game of chess, and over the next few years her skills improve more and more, and she strives to be the best at chess while also using her skills to help her family. So this is directed by Mira, I think it's... Nair? Nair? Yeah, okay. That's how it sounds. Yeah. And it stars Medina Nwanga, David Oyelowo, and Lupita Nyong'o, and it's a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, certified, certified fresh as well, and 86% of audiences liked it. Yeah. And as we go into Queen of Catway, one thing I didn't do when we did the station ID is say, hey, our number is 7804909. That's 7804909. We're here until 8.30. We're going to talk about Queen of Catway. And for me, I think this was, in my opinion, the most enjoyable of the three we saw. This, I mean, of course it had its moments. And you could tell that there's an influence from the House of Mouse. Mm-hmm. But much like sports movies, and they, they, they almost do this like a sports movie. I mean, you have that woven tale that you know, you're introduced to kind of an underdog things happen success failure and a ramp back up but to know that this was a true story actually helps with that i think yeah it reminds me a lot of eddie the eagle in a sense yeah. which came out earlier this year it's like this feel-good sports movie i just left out left the theater with a smile on my face i'm like Man, this is it was just good it was mm-hmm. you know powerful performances by you know all all the leads they and they're all, all their characters are you know well fleshed out, especially because they get plenty of screen time. The runtime is, I believe, just a little bit over two hours, yes. so they all have plenty of time for their characters to develop. And it's like they were they were great. Like there's 
There's nothing much I could say about that other than yeah. they were great. I mean, I when I see films directed by Mirnier, I pretty much go to them. I mean, uh, The Namesake, Monsoon Wedding, uh, Amelia, Vanity Fair, and The Reluctant Fundamentalist don't rate highly as her films, but I like them both. She just has such a lyrical way of telling a story in a very visual way. In, in this film, you're in the slums. You're in the upper crust schools. You're in the tournaments. She really brings that reality in. And, you know, you, you see the experience through Fiona's eyes. For sure, yeah. And in, I love how they... You know, they show a couple things, just the how, you know, the other children would mock Fiona or even other children of Catway when they go to this tournament in a, you know, better developed neighborhood. And it's, you know, and it's, the students doubt them, but, you know, Fiona beats them all. Or It's re- just it, impressive. It's a character you can certainly root for, you know. Yeah. And, you know, of course, feminists could really get behind this being that it, you know it's a female director and strong female characters but i think there's a great balance of the sexes here there you know the empowerment of the women start of course with the lupita nyong'o character she's a a widow who's trying her best to raise her kids you find out that she not only lost her husband she lost a child she's got a child who is walking a different path. And then she's got Fiona who is being empowered much like her mother and the encouragement by Robert Katande. I mean, can I just say, I wish there were more people in the world like Robert Katande. Oh my, yeah. I was like, <laughs> I love this character. He, he was great. Like, so he, he's an engineer, right? He graduated mm-hmm. as an engineer or he was trying to look for work, but he ends up working, you know, for, for this missionary it's just it's just incredible to think that this is true and that he was able to just help someone else achieve their dreams and now he just stuck with them through to the end or even beyond that it's just we definitely yeah uh, he's he's great yeah and you see his i mean obviously he was an engineer he also is a sportsman with soccer but by utilizing this game of chess and the way he taught it, 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 most of the kids he taught couldn't read or write. But by teaching them the strategy and teaching them that having a plan, whether it be a game of chess or in life, it just gave them such a foundation to spring from that it, the ending of the movie, you see what these what these kids that he worked with moved on to. So you kind of... You, as you watching the story unfold to know that they moved ahead and it was that guidance that he gave them and, you know, sharing of what he knew mm-hmm. and helping them grow. Yeah. And there's definitely a lot of other very good, you know, chess analogies, which kind of has like this like Disney charm to it. It's like, you can definitely understand like how it could be relatable. Like, there's an example like when Fiona's being taught about the pawn that can turn into a queen if you put it all the way at the end of the board. Mm-hmm. It's like the small one can become the big one. It's just, it doesn't matter where you come from just as long as you try and you can achieve. I think that's one thing it definitely reinforced. And it's you know it's just a good message. I think it's just something it's a, something good to watch and listen to. So yeah, and you know it's um, surprise for. For Disney to be behind this and not be so much in front of it, usually Disney films, you know that it's a Disney film. This one's very quietly Disney. And yeah. I don't know if it's because it's live action as opposed to the animated films, mm. but it's 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 good to see House of Mouse do a strong story like this. And, you know, I think it's well written. Yeah, you know there's a formula to it and you know what the outcome's going to be. But I really enjoyed the ride, getting to know yeah. these characters. I mean, it even throws, you know, definitely throws some curveballs every mm-hmm. now and then, too. It isn't just, like, straightforward. So that, that's something I also enjoyed. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I hope this one's not overshadowed because I think that the, the three main characters, uh, David Oyelowo, Lupita Nyong'o, Medina Nawanga, they all should... I, I, I've yet to see movies that I would outshine their performances, so I think 
you know, hopefully they'll get recognized yeah, I, during the, by their peers during awards season. Yeah, I'd say out of the movies we've discussed, I think this movie had the strongest performances overall. Yeah. So, so of the theater releases, Deepwater Horizon, pretty yeah, good. Go see it. Let's go see it. Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Probably wait. You could wait for DVD. Yeah. Um, Queen of Kawe, certainly. It's not a whiz bang film, but I would see it in a theater. Yeah, if, I mean, if you're just looking for something uplifting and inspiring, this is definitely the film for you. Yeah. Before we sign off, I do want to mention, um, as we try to do here on Cinema Hits and Misses, uh, films that are kind of special interest, especially if the New England are main made. And here um, we've got a press release from Killentainment. Uh, about Bad Kid. Uh, Kill Entertainment Incorporated is proud to announce the world premiere of Bad Kid, which is a f- feature film made in Maine. It's going to premiere at the Auburn Flagship Cinema with a one-week theater run. It starts on Friday, October 14th. The synopsis is, Izzy was thrust into the foster care system as a very young child after the brutal and senseless murder of her parents. Dealing with her anger and feelings of abandonment, Izzy has made some rough choices that have led her to one final chance to get things right. In an overburdened system, oftentimes it's difficult or nearly impossible to get a foster child all the help they need. Sometimes it's the wrong help altogether. Will anyone believe her? Will anyone care? Now, this is a thriller drama. Its runtime is 90 minutes. And again, Bad Kid was produced by Kill Entertainment Films in association with Freight, Ta- Freight Train Films, both locally operated film companies. The premiere is Friday at 7 p.m. Flagship Cinema, Auburn, Maine. And if you want more information on the film, you can find it on the Kill Entertainment. That's K I L L A T. A-I-N-M-E-N-T dot com backslash bad kid. Um, just knowing this is uh, Seth Roberts' director, I uh, you know one of the producers here, Alan Dillingham, and Kill Entertainment makes some, I think, provocative films hmm. and fun thriller films. So, yeah, we wish them well on their opening next weekend. And in the meantime, we're getting to the end of the show here. 